My name is June Lagme, or the correct Filipino pronunciation is Lagmai. Um, my father is Filipino American, and my mother is Japanese. I was actually born in Yokohama, Japan, where my parents uh, courted and married and had me. And then my dad moved us down to uh, what is now historic Filipino town, and that's where I grew up. I started feeling um, being Asian on campus at UCLA, and there was uh, uh, Pacific Ties, a Asian-run newspaper on the campus, and I started writing poetry for it and started expressing deeply felt outrage about Manzanar, about um, people always teasing Asian women about being small and the texture of our hair and our you know, physiognomy. So it was very important to say, you need to hear me. I have a different story than you. And I think a lot of it had to do with um, standing up for my mom, who was a very modest woman. She never learned English, as I said. She worked in a sweatshop. And I think about her history and how she grew up in Japan and how she signed up uh, as a soldier in the Japanese army and, and put in a prison camp and faced all that travail and suffering and came to this country and people maybe looked funny at her because of, the, of her accent or whatever. And so I took it very personally. I said, you know, how dare you say those things because you're saying that against my mom. You're saying that against my family. So going to college was, if everything else I learned there is obsolete. I learned how to become Asian American and I learned to be more vocal about being a lesbian and out lesbian. I guess I didn't run up against uh, bigotry until my college years when I came out as a, as a lesbian and students would come up to me in the student lounge and tell me I was going to hell and that I was a pervert. Um, but on the other hand, I kind of liked the fight because at least I thought I'm getting a rise out of you. I'm making you think. I, so I just believed wherever you were, ask questions and try, try to not fit in, but to ask authority why are things the way it is and couldn't it be better. After college, I worked at several different positions. I worked at the Gay and Lesbian Community Services Center where I met some very great people like uh, Taki Yamamoto and Paul Chen and Morris Kite. Um, I then worked for a political campaign to seat Don Amador. I was working for Don Amador, who was running for city council at the time that Harvey Milk was assassinated. So that was very real to me. So uh, Don and Harvey were very good friends and they were sort of teasing me because Harvey Milk had a assistant, Anne, I think her name was, that was uh, his right-hand woman, and I was Don Amador's right-hand woman. So uh, this, we, there was a lot of strategy between Don and Harvey that they should cement a gay councilman slash supervisor in both the major gay cities of California, San Francisco and Los Angeles. Harvey won, Don did not. Harvey was uh, assassinated and Don moved on to other things. As the movement matured, it became more apparent to me that you've got to come out where you are. That was the only way I believed that we're going to change hearts and minds to eventually come to the place where we don't have this stupid conversation anymore. Coming out has been a graduate gradual process of my entire life, different events, different contexts, okay? And because, and, and I was saved in a way from technically coming out to my family in that I never went through a period where I was single and I did the dating scene and I dated men and then switched to women and back to men and then women. 
question myself. I had a really different way of getting into that part of my being, which is the fact that I just naturally fell in love with another woman at a very young age. Uh, 13, 14, 15, 16 is awful young. So Rita and I enjoyed, say, the first 20, 30 years of our relationship where nobody needed to say anything. Uh, my parents' family loved her. Her parents' family loved me. You have to remember the context of the times, too. It was the 70s at the end of the uh, flower power period. And it was at this period that Reed and I, starting our own lives and household together, did sort of open our eyes and look at the larger world. And that's when we started to seek out other gay Catholics, other gay people. Um, that's when we uh, started finding other gay and lesbian uh, Asian Pacific people. And that's when we fell into starting um, APLG. In those days, it was just called the Gay Community Center, and I was working there at the time that there was this big brouhaha whether or not to change the name to the GLCSC, and there was actually a lot of debate about it, which is sort of amazing now. So it was at the GLCSC, maybe 76, 77, like that. And it was actually Paul Chen that I met. Paul Chen was uh, a very bright, light of a young Chinese gay man. And literally, when he walked into the GLCSC, there were so few open API Asians at those time, at that time. It, it was literally that we saw each other down the hall and we just said, hi, hi, how are you? It was like, oh my God, I'm not the only one. It was like that. So Paul and I became early fast friends and since we had found each other, as we continued our friendship, we said, how do you think there must be other people out there? And Paul was pursuing his degree in psychology and had some contacts. And through contact of contact of contact, it was he who knew Morris Kite. He was the one that gave us the opportunity after Paul had contacted a few of his friends. And at the time, Morris's lover was a, a gay male Asian to invite these scattering of gay Asian people to his house, to Morris's house in Hollywood, to have a meeting to say, here we are, what shall we do? Shall we create an organization? Should we create something for ourselves? So that was very unique and very moving because I think that was the very first time that the smattering of, uh, of AP gay people found each other and started reaching out their hands to each other saying, let's, let's make a group. But it was at uh, Morris's house and I distinctly remember Morris saying, you have got to organize yourselves. Don't let the European community do it for you. And I'll always remember him saying that. Wiser words were not spoken. So uh, it was very shortly after that, perhaps a matter of weeks or months, that um, we all spread the word as best we could. But we got about 40 or 50 people that ended up coming to that first meeting in his apartment in the um, Mid-Wilshire area. And it was then that they voted Paul and me to be the first co-chairs just to get things rolling. And with you is your partner of 40 years, she shall sure we say, is. your, your wife, could you stand here? up so we can all see you in the camera here? That's Rita Romero. First time I saw June, we were having an orientation in high school. Um, 40 years ago. <laughs> Entering the ninth grade. Junie was the- I was teacher's pet, yes. I was the A student. This one they called the Frito Bandito, always getting detention, smoking in the girl's room. <laughs> so you can imagine, it was, it's like Greece, you know, the good girl and the bad boy. She would do stupid stuff like steal my shoes. Uh, and I'd have to go through the whole school day without shoes. And I was very flattered by the intention, but it was like, it was making me, pissing me off too. Uh, I think you were the one that actually crossed over and gave me my kiss. 
and I felt like I was falling through a black hole, and it was wonderful. We had such a um, intense, a very intense relationship, wouldn't you say? <laughs> mm -hmm. Growing up, and it was it was fun because since we have been together for so long, and since we started so at such a young age, we kind of like melded into this person or this being that has so solidified that yes. I don't know where I end and I, I don't know where, where, where she begins. We actually had two weddings. Uh, the license expired hmm. on the third, so we ran up to the um, Board of Supervisors and uh, Supervisor Zev Yaroslavsky. Uh, signed our marriage license on the third, but then the fifth we wanted the the social ceremony. Mm -hmm. So he came to our house with all our uh, families there, and it was an amazing experience because everyone wanted to be there, and were so supportive, and it was so natural. But you know, for as long as we've been together, that that one day was really one of the happiest days of my life. It was um, it was so special. Why why was that? It was was it legitimacy? Was like, you know, it was like go you know just going coming full circle. Yeah, full circle. That's what it was. Getting married at such a late a late stage of our relationship. Everybody else there had a good time, but they seemed to be not as spun around and and amazed by it as we were. Yeah. And I, I said so Spend during my, That's good. my I, remarks yeah. at the ceremony. I said, you know, Rita and I are having a hard time wrapping our, our, our brains around the fact that we, that what is happening right here. And everyone was so gracious and so um, loving. And uh, uh, we want it to be easier for the people that come after us. It should not have to be such a struggle. Which brings up another thing is the fact that I admire so much that so many uh, gay and lesbian couples are choosing to have children and have families. That was unheard of in our day. If we could do it again, we might have tried it. Um, oh, absolutely. I mean, if I was young, I, I think I would have wanted my, my, my four kids. And four? <laughs> Four? Yeah, I think you never told nice, me that. That's a nice number. Okay. Four. And, you know, I, I just hope that, you know, lesbians and, and gay men today, you know, do get married and do have children. You, you, you deserve it. So those skills that we learned in APLG, I think, I hope it improved us as people and I hope that it left a shadow so that organizations like API Equality don't have to go through the, the shit <laughs> that um, we came from, that we had to overcome. And so we're hoping that you will, you of the computer age, you of the Google age, you of the now informational generation can take the torch so much more further and that we don't have to even have conversations about can gay people marry anymore, can gay people serve in the armed forces anymore. Those are old arguments and I'm tired of having them. Make a safe place for each other, treat each other like real brothers and sisters, and someday you will be the pioneers that people will ask in an interview, what was it like in your day? So have a ball, enjoy yourself, and be kind to each other, and leave a good place as you move through life. Leave good waves in your wake. That's my advice to you.